Good, uh, good morning from me as well. Great to see you here today. Do you get that passage from Isaiah open in front of you in your Bibles, if you will? It's on um, page 741 as a reminder. It's great to be with you today as we continue looking at this series we've been at in the last few weeks of servant songs in Isaiah. Now, I'd like to use, you to use your imagination a bit to start with. Uh, imagine, if you will, an alien that came down to visit planet Earth and wanted to find out more about the human race. They noticed, probably, that, that many humans seem to call themselves Christians. So they decide, oh, let's find out more. But what do you think their main questions would be? What would stick out to them? What might they want to know? Uh, they might be curious about this idea of God as Trinity, or maybe about the Bible. One thing I think would really stick out to them is this. Uh, what is so significant? What is the big deal about the cross? What is it about the cross that makes it this central symbol of the Christian faith? You see it everywhere. Uh, you see it on, uh, on churches, on necklaces, even on many countries, flags. Uh, at the baptism earlier, we had the sign of the cross on Joel and Mila's foreheads. What is it all about? I wonder what kind of answer uh, that visitor would get. I wonder about you as you sit here today. What does the cross mean to you? Maybe you've never really thought about it before. Maybe it seems a bit irrelevant to your life. Maybe it strikes you as a little bit weird to have as the main symbol of the Christian faith a gruesome means of execution and uh, worn as a decorative ornament. A bit weird, maybe. Maybe it speaks to you of life and love and hope. Maybe it used to feel like that, but now it just seems a bit familiar, a bit samey. Now, the Bible, unsurprisingly, has a lot to say about the cross. What might be more of a surprise is that one of the clearest explanations of what it's all about is right here in this passage in Isaiah. <clears throat> I mean, just think how extraordinary that is. Words written centuries and centuries before Jesus was born... And yet here we find an account of not only many of the details of what happened to Jesus at his crucifixion, but an insight into what it all means as well. We'll get to the passage itself in a moment, but let's just uh, take us uh, a moment to remind ourselves, and for those uh, visitors today, just to kind of uh, catch you up on where we've been in recent weeks. This is the fourth and final servant song uh, in Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been building up a portrait of this uh, character called the Servant. It keeps coming up. We've seen different aspects of his character and mission, his passion for justice, his gentle tenderness, speaking God's words and facing opposition. And we've seen how all those things are fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus. And yet, here in the fourth song, the longest of the four, things suddenly come into even sharper focus. The song's melody sounds out more clearly. So what sort of melody do we hear? What kind of theme? Well, to put it simply, the servant's suffering saves sinners. Nice and alliterative for you. The servant's suffering saves sinners. Uh, do you, you can follow along on the, the uh, sermon handout as well that was uh, given out at the start. Let's just take a look at how Isaiah weaves this theme through his song. It comes up all the way through. Uh, but the song comes in as five main sections, uh, each with three verses, each with a particular focus. Now for us, uh, we'd usually expect, when we're reading something, the main point to come at the end maybe, to kind of build up to it. But actually, in, in Hebrew poetry, it's often found right in the middle. And that's exactly what we see here. Hmm. Let's just chase this a moment. Uh, so for the first, the first and fifth part, they speak of the servant's final victory, a glorious triumph. It's sort of language of being raised up, highly exalted in the first part, and in the latter, of prospering, being satisfied, dividing the spoils. First bit. But then parts two and four, they come in and speak of the servant's suffering, rejection, being despised, scorned, a life cruelly cut short after an unjust trial. And you might put those things next to each other and think, what is going on? How do these things fit together? It doesn't quite seem to add up. What's the meaning of all this? 
And that's where the central part comes in. Verses 4 to 6, that's where we're going to focus particularly today. Because it pulls back the curtain, it reveals the deeper story going on. The main melody sounding out clear and true. And even within that one, it's the very central verse, verse 5, that sounds out the clearest. <laughs> Let me read it for us again. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. He suffered for us. So this was, this was no ordinary death. There's a link between what this servant suffered and, and what it says are our iniquities. Iniquity being another word for what the Bible calls sin. Who is the, the us here? Is it just Isaiah and, and his generation? Uh, maybe all of, of Israel? Well, in comes verse 6 with impeccable timing in the song uh, to give the answer. It says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the rest of the Bible tells us that that all is all-inclusive. It is all people, everywhere, throughout time. All those who, who followed in the footsteps of Adam and Eve from Genesis 3 onwards. We were looking at uh, Genesis in our sermon series recently, weren't we? Uh, seeing uh, all those who followed in their footsteps. Now, the, the picture of a sheep here, uh, it might get you thinking about kind of a poor, harmless, fluffy little sheep that's just accidentally wandered off course. While well, this verse says we are like sheep in our wandering, actually we are not sheep. We have a responsibility, a greater responsibility for our actions, for our choices. We are accountable. Sadly, we can see the effect of, of, the, of people choosing their own way, rejecting God's way. In the world, all around us each day, the pain, the mess that is caused. Now, uh, we've seen this answer in verse 6 uh, about uh, our iniquities, our sin, but there's a step between verse 6 and that central theme of verse 5. Some of you might have already spotted it and me thinking it, because the step is that there is a consequence for those choices, that sin. That justice demands a reckoning for turning away from God's way. In the language of verse 5, a punishment is due. Now that is not an easy pill to swallow, especially in our culture today. Uh, it, it, it's, it seems perhaps harsh or judgmental, even vindictive, uh, to have a consequence like that for people uh, living their lives as they see fit. But when we stop and think, Consider the states of our world, a state that's come about largely by people living as they see fit. The hurt and pain that's caused, the, the hurt that we carry with us. Don't we long for justice, for a moral order to the universe where all that's wrong will be righted in the end? Not a, not a comfortable thought, especially uh, we can think about justice out there, it's less comfortable when it's for us as well. I know when I look in my own heart, I see the pride and selfishness in me, the hurt I'm capable of doing to others. I know I have no right to stand before the perfectly holy God of the universe. And there's, there's much, much more that could be said about uh, both God's holiness, his perfection, and our sin. But one thing is just worth noting, is it will never grasp the wonder the, the, the astonishing, scandalous grace of verse 5, until we realise those two things, at the depth of our plight as sinful people and the height of God's holiness and perfection and justice. But it's in verse 5 that those two seemingly irreconcilable realities are brought together by the servant. We sang that at the start of, of justice and mercy meeting. So he is pierced, he is crushed, not for any sin of his own, because he had none. No, it was for our transgressions, our iniquities, all our wrongdoing. That's what it's saying, so all that was due to us because of our sin, he takes on himself. The burden we should rightly bear, he carries for us. Uh, the story is told of an incident that occurred during the Second World War. 
I believe the prisons of war uh, were forced into manual labour in the jungles of Southeast Asia. It's what the film Bridge Over the River Quiet was uh, based on, that, those, that sort of time, that, that area. And one time, uh, it happened that the Japanese guards, uh, they checked uh, at the end of the day that all the tools were accounted for. They checked all the shovels and found that one was missing. They asked, and, and no one was willing to own up to taking it. No one stepped forward. And so the furious guard, he took up his rifle, and he was ready to kill the whole lot of them as punishment. But before he could fire, one soldier stepped forward and confessed and was killed where he stood. Later on, when the tools were counted again, none were missing. The guard had miscounted. The soldier had been innocent, yet he had willingly given his life to stand in the place of others. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? It's a true story uh, told by uh, the Scottish uh, prisoner of war, Ernest Gordon, later on in the, in the book. But what we see is a remarkable sacrifice, yet what we see here is even more extraordinary. See, in that, uh, that uh, story, none of those prisoners were guilty, were they, in the end? The innocent gave his life to save the innocent. And yet here, in this, this story here, in this passage, the innocent gives his life for the guilty. He took what we deserved. And the kind of uh, picture here is one of, of a law court, uh, of one party taking the penalty due to the other one, being a, a substitute, being a substitute in our place. That is the picture, that's the theme of this song. The servant, this servant character, he takes the punishment due to those who've done wrong as a substitute, and so makes peace, brings together. So who is this song about? Who is this servant? Well, as we've said earlier, uh, the Bible couldn't be clear about who this is. This, actually, this passage is quoted more times in the New Testament part of the Bible than any other. Almost every verse we've had read is quoted from at some point in the New Testament. And the unanimous verdict is, across all those writings, that Jesus is the servant. And only Jesus. That's the, that's the testimony of, of all the New Testament writers, of Peter, of Paul, of Luke, of Jesus himself, the night before his crucifixion, quoted uh, this passage about himself. See, Jesus in his death on the cross, he's not uh, dying the tragic death of a failed religious leader. Not at all. Uh, despite what many of those looking on thought, his death was this moment described in verse 5. He took on himself all that our sin deserved. Punishment, separation from God as a perfect substitute. But not only does the New Testament look back to this chapter and see it fulfilled in Jesus, it's also true the other way around as well, that Isaiah in writing this, he is looking forward to Jesus, uh, prophesying what would happen. The details are just too close a fit to say otherwise. It's not just in, in the things that Jesus uh, could have controlled, like staying silent before his accusers, we heard that, that they read. It's the things that are beyond his apparent control too. Being executed alongside criminals, being buried in a rich man's tomb. And there's multiple others as well. The servant here is Jesus, remarkably speaking, 600 years uh, into the future. And what is the result of all this? What, what's the result of, of what the servant does? Well, two things that are highlighted in verse 5. Firstly, peace. Not just a, a temporary truce kind of peace or a lull in conflict, but true, lasting peace that brings wholeness and harmony. Don't we long for that in our world? And secondly, healing. Uh, from all our hurts, all our brokenness, with the things we've done, the things done to us. Here there is hope and a promise of true healing. Not all at once, not right away. We always experience a measure of that brokenness in our lives in this world, but there is a certain promise here that it will come, <coughs> because it has been won. Now, before we come to just to think about how we might respond to these things, there's one more crucial point to address. And it's perhaps the most astounding of all. 
You see, you might hear all this and think, wow, that Jesus, he gets a pretty raw deal, doesn't he? Why should he suffer for us? He didn't do anything wrong. Well, the other week, we were at a, a circus show on holiday. If you want to know more about holiday, you can ask afterwards. It was an interesting time. Uh, but there came the point in this circus show uh, when the clown came down and came around the audience, choosing unwitting volunteers to go on the stage for a comedy stunt. That was nothing. Much to my family's disappointment and much to my relief, I managed to avoid this fate by kind of carefully avoiding uh, the, the eye to eye contact. And, but four uh, unwitting volunteers were uh, selected to go on stage. But Jesus is nothing like that. He's not an unlucky volunteer just kind of picked on by God to take the stage in the role of the servants. Not at all. And we see from the Bible that Jesus is no bypassing stranger, you know, just wrong place, wrong time. Now he is the one who, much earlier in this same book of Isaiah, is called Emmanuel, God with us. And Isaiah 9, that reading, you'll have heard of many a Christmas service. He is the child born whose title is Mighty God. He is none other than God come to live among us, come ultimately to die for us. I mean, see what an astounding thing this is. It's almost beyond our comprehension that that despised, cursed man on the cross, rejected, bearing the weight of our sin, that's God with us. God for us. The truth is that there is no price that God demands we pay for our sin that he's not also willing to pay on our behalf. No consequence for sin that Jesus does not stoop to offer to bear in our place. Here we see the judge of all, the righteous judge, step down from his throne to stand in the place of the accused, taking on human form to be able to be our substitute, opening a way for us to be forgiven, freed, restored, healed. And this is the very beating heart of the good news of the gospel, the beating heart of God's extravagant, gracious love for us. That is the melody of this song. Jesus, God himself, dying in our place, that through him we may have life and light and love. I haven't got time to talk about those hints of resurrection and new life uh, for the servant after all his suffering at the end of the passage. I have to leave that for another time, maybe Easter Sunday. Uh, but having heard the song, what might be your response? Well, perhaps for some of us, uh, we just struggle to see why our sin is such a big deal. Why is it so serious that to need this drastic action? We might not see how it all fits together. How does it all add up? My encouragement to you this Easter is to look at the cross. Really look. See there God's estimation of our sin. Of what it took to deal with it and, and the full extent of his love that this shows us. Perhaps for others, uh, we need no prompting to feel the weight of our sin, our guilt, our shame. Maybe the challenge is believing that this could really be true, that Jesus really does love you that much to come and endure the suffering of the cross for you, to rescue you. My encouragement to you also is to look at the cross, really look. See all that it means, all the lengths, see the lengths that he went to, see the evidence of his love. And for others, perhaps the truth has just become too familiar, too ordinary. I know, I know it can do for me at times. We, we think about it so often that we start to take it for granted. We lose the sense of awe at what it costs to rescue us, to be at peace with God. Or in my encouragement to us is, if that's you, well, you've guessed it, to, to look again, at the cross, really, look, especially to come to this Easter time, feel the weight of it all, and see the glory and rejoice in all that it means for us. As we uh, respond to what we've heard, perhaps to help the way to come to a close, is to bring this just closer to home, to, to personalise it, uh, and just to reflect on these words, uh, to, to just change things, to, to say, uh, Jesus and me. So adapting those words, surely Jesus took up my pain and bore my suffering. Jesus was pierced for my 
transgressions, crushed for my iniquities. The punishment that brought me peace was on Jesus, and by Jesus' wounds I am healed. I, like a sheep, have gone astray. I have turned to my own way. The Lord has laid on Jesus all my iniquity. Perhaps that helps to remind us that this is not just some abstract truth out there, but it has direct relevance to each one of us here today. If you've never known this for yourself, can I finish by encouraging you that the invitation is open. All has been done. All is made ready. You can receive the gift of this peace and healing and love today. If that's you, I'd love to uh, talk that through with you, talk to myself or, or Phil after the service. We'd love to chat through that with you, opportunities to explore that further. As we come to close this time together, let me uh, pray. Our gracious God, thank you for this song in Isaiah 53, for the wonderful truth that it points to, that Jesus died for us, paying the price for our sins, that we might know peace with you, that we might know healing and hope and life and love. Please help us never to take this for granted. As we come to this Easter time, may each of us come to have a fresh grasp of all that this means for us and for our world. In Jesus' name, amen.